Now, here's an interesting project that uh, we're going to be doing today. Andre de Reiter, the author of Truth to Power, the former chief executive of Eskom, is somewhere far away from the clutches of the bad guys. So as a consequence, he wants to stay safe. They've already tried to kill him once. Uh, and he has turned down any invitation for an interview, not even a telephonic interview, because I guess nowadays you can find out where people are, if you know where their phones, who they're speaking to, etc. Anyway, so we've had a email interview and it's been fascinating, just as good as a telephonic interview. However, there's one big difference. As we haven't got a um, Afrikaans English speaking voice, uh, in Amazon's Polly, we've had to use an American male voice. So you'll hear Dorator as you've never heard him before, but it's his words I show you. And this is all about Andre Dorator's book, Truth to Power, which has elicited some very interesting responses. My response, which is the one that matters, I guess, for the purposes of this interview, and let's just show you what the book looks like in case you haven't had a chance to get it yet. Go and buy it. That's my first response. Read it. My second response. And third, absorb it. Spend your time listening uh, to yourself, reflecting on it. And it's not going to take you very long to realize that this guy is a whistleblower, der decent, the ultimate whistleblower, and a person who's put his own position, his own life, his own future at risk by exposing the malfeasance that is going on in South Africa. Also, it tells me that the ANC government must take full responsibility for the economic disaster that's been caused by load shedding. They were warned time and time again, and you can read this page after page, they were warned about what was coming down the, uh, the, the track and they refused to listen. And in, on top of all of that, they were also told about the rampant criminality that's occurring in Eskom by De Reiter and some people before him. And it's not just the Guptas, it's after the Guptas as well. And nothing has been done about it. This republic of no consequences, hopefully the citizens will decide in 2024 that they're going to make it a republic of consequences and punish those who are directly responsible for the awful situation that South Africa's in right now. But let's move into the book. Um, I found it to be very well written and easy to read and in a league of its own for courage. My first question to Mr. Dorator was, what did you intend to achieve with the publication of this book. ESCOM is at the heart of the South African economy. Its performance affects every citizen, and it is, therefore, a matter of public interest that people know what lies at the heart of our problems. It is also important that South Africans realize that the energy crisis is a solvable problem and that the solution can, in fact, be the catalyst to unlocking economic growth, employment and improving our export competitiveness. Given the incredible complexity of the challenges involved, I thought it important that people understand more about why we are where we are and how we can get out of it. You appear to have gone to extraordinary lengths to get the book out quickly and to hide its distribution. Why? How big a team worked on the publishing project and for how long? Everyone involved in the book agreed that time to publication was important, given the prevailing energy crisis. In view of the litigious environment and inflammatory comments by some role players, getting the book out on the shelf to prevent any preemptive steps, Penguin put in place a top-notch editorial team who ensured that the writing and production process went as quickly and smoothly as possible. My earlier-than-anticipated departure also gave me an unexpected opportunity to devote substantially more time to the book. That earlier-than-anticipated departure was a result of an interview that Dorator granted to Annika Larson on ETV. He says that at the time, the deal was that the interview would only be flighted after he had departed Eskom, in other words, two months hence. 
But after they'd had the discussion, Larson and her producers said to him that it was in the national interest to get this information out into the public domain as soon as possible. He writes in his book that he agreed. He is uh, sorry that he did so. And the result of getting that out into uh, the public meant that, well, he had to leave a lot sooner than he had anticipated. I asked him, with this book, he's become the ultimate South African whistleblower and for many a national hero. In many parts of the book, incidentally, he talks about people coming up to him and shaking his hand and saying, hang in there, Andre, hang in there. You are doing a wonderful job for us. Please don't leave Eskom. My question to him was, after the book had been written and published, how do you expect that your life and that of your family will change? I'm taking it a day at a time right now. I'm trying to have a bit of a rest while come consulting with lawyers and forensic specialists, and of course attending to media queries. I hope that in the fullness of time the ad hominem attacks will die down, and that we will start engaging on the core of the problem, and how we can solve it. On reflection, could you have blown the whistle differently? You've been accused of being naive. Was there an alternative? In some ways I'm the boy who pointed out that the emperor's new clothes were imaginary, and that the naked truth was far less attractive than everyone pretended. But I think someone has to say out loud what many were thinking, otherwise we are forsaking our duty to our country. Fortunately I am not alone, courageous people like Busi Mavuso, Malagapur Makugobu, Thami Madansala and many others have been speaking up and that makes a huge difference. Thami Madonsela is Tumi Madonsela, and uh, Malegapuru Mahoba is in the picture here. The chairman for a long period at Eskom, he comes out very well in the book as a considered wise man. Mpo Makwana, the chairman who succeeded him uh, on the at the time that virtually the whole Eskom board was fired by Pravin Gordon, uh, he doesn't come out as well at all. Mpo Makwana and Andre Dereta did not see eye to eye on many things and Dereta does not hide his disdain for um, Mpo's approach towards running a board. As for the content itself, I then asked Mr. Dereta, was he surprised at the depth of the corruption at Eskom that he found? And this is an important question given that Eskom was ground zero for the Guptas, you remember Mark Pamensky was sent in there by them to find ways of plundering at a rapid rate. Also alongside him were Brian Molefi, who comes out really poorly, poorly in this uh, book, as does Anosh Singh. Here's what Mr. Dorator responded with. Like all South Africans, I had an apprehension of corruption at ESCOM but I must admit to being taken aback at the extent that still remained. The more I dug, the more it became apparent that corrupt networks had become entrenched, and that ESCOM was the victim of rampant criminality perpetrated by organized crime cartels. With the departure of the Guptas, crime had not been excised but instead had metastasized to affect almost every aspect of ESCOM's operations, and particular generation. Isn't that awful? So it's like a cancer that hadn't been cut out, but had uh, metastasized, got bigger, and just grown to affect every part of Eskom's operations. And this is a theme, again, that comes through in the book. As you read it, you'll be horrified by the amount of money that is being siphoned out of the system. The ANC from time to time apparently say, but let people eat a little i.e. allow them to partake in a little bit of corruption. Had that been the case at Eskom, we would probably not have known about any of what was disclosed in Dorator's book. But the trouble is, when a thief steals a hundred rand, next time it's not enough, he wants five hundred, and then a thousand, and then ten thousand, and then a hundred thousand. It's part of the human condition. I asked him, how many of the power stations have been captured? From the information that was gathered, 
It seems as if the bulk of power stations on the Ampum along the High Veld have significant organized crime operations in place. While the other stations, Leitabo, Free State, Madupi and Watimba, Limpopo and Coburg, Western Cape, have had some cases of fraud and corruption, the extent is far less. It's interesting to note that these four power stations which are outside of Mpumalonga are also far and away the best performing in the ESCOM fleet, suggesting a clear link between criminal activity and poor generation performance, and hence load shedding. Very interesting points that he makes there, that the four power stations outside of Mpumalanga are the best performers, and there it appears as though the corruption is lower on an operational basis than in Pumalanga. The book as well talks about criminal syndicates that are based in the Mpumalanga province where most of South Africa's coal is mined. And the heartland of all of this is in Standerton, right near one of the Eskom power stations. So I asked him, given that it was the bombshell of stage six load shedding that Happening happened for the very first time that greeted you on your arrival as the chief executive at Eskom. What are the risks of even higher levels of load shedding being imposed in the future? We hear that low, a level 8 is just around the corner and some people are even talking about a level 16. Everyone knows what that means. But when do you think that load shedding will end, Mr. Derator, or at least start becoming manageable? The first incident of Stage 6 load shedding took place in December 2019, immediately prior to my joining ESCOM. Regrettably, due to the many reasons referred to in my book, generation performance did not improve. This is not entirely unexpected, as evidence from the U.S. suggests a performance cliff after a station passes 50 years of age. With the average age of the ESCOM fleet now more than 44 years, excluding Madupi and Kuzil and with maintenance having been badly neglected by my less than illustrious predecessors, it's no surprise that the risk of load shedding increases. The solution is to add much more capacity on an urgent basis, something which I started advocating for from the first month of my tenure. Once the steam generator replacement project at Coburg is completed, and the three units at Kuzil return by the end of the year, the risk of load shedding will reduce, but not be eliminated. We need more capacity, period. The quickest and cheapest way of doing this is by further liberalizing the market so that the private sector can invest, predominantly in renewables, and not by entering into expensive and onerous contracts for power ships as a result of a self-generated crisis. This requires a little more explanation, particularly the last bit, because it is a theme that runs through Dorator's book. Let the private sector get involved and the solution will happen. Don't try and control everything. That will not solve anything. And indeed, that's the reason why we're in so much trouble. He does uh, also disclose in a part of the book that South Africa's highly admired renewable energy tenders, uh, I think we're now into stage six, it's admired all over the world. Well, the person who was responsible for it has been forced out of that position and the new people who are in there have allowed the accumulation uh, of new energy to fall off a cliff. It's just this extraordinary amount of inability to realize that you don't know what you don't know. He's also, as you heard there, strongly against the whole idea of these power ships from Turkey, which is an obsession that has apparently gripped the Minerals Department and its minister, Gwedi Mantash. I then moved on to the budget, and here's a picture from earlier this year after a finance minister, Enoch Gorondwana, announced a 254 billion rand bailout for Eskom. I'll just pause there a minute. That's about a quarter of all the taxes that will be collected in South Africa this year. Around a quarter is going to be injected into Eskom this year. But you add to that what has gone in before, and we've now got a total bailout 
of 500 billion rand. Now, you might recall that when Cyril Ramaphosa spoke about the Guptas and the theft at a conference in London, he said that state capture had cost South Africa 500 billion. That's exactly the same amount as we're now seeing has to be injected or has been injected by taxpayers into ESCOM. I asked Mr. Dorator if he supported or even motivated this bailout, and if so, why? As a result of numerous adverse tariff decisions made by NERSA, ESCOM's revenue cannot begin to cover its reasonable costs, i.e. excluding inefficiency and corruption. As ESCOM is still responsible for executing capital projects and keeping its operations running, it has to borrow to fund its operating expenses. It doesn't take an MBA to figure out that this is unsustainable. To prevent ESCOM from defaulting on its debt, which would, in all probability, result in a sovereign default, there was no option but for the taxpayer, via National Treasury, to inject additional equity. Of course, the answer is to let users pay for electricity through cost-reflective tariffs, which NERSA was only starting to do after ESCOM took it to court, and won eight times. So, Dorator says that the problem here is with the inability of NERSA, which is the regulator, to give ESCOM proper tariff increases. But also included in that is the plundering that has been going on, which he articulates on very well in his book. So my question was from the evidence in your book, even a superficial reading suggests that ESCOM has become a direct conduit through which a large chunk of the taxes that we pay, remember, that 500 billion rand bailout, is going into the pockets of criminals. Of that 500 billion rand Eskom has received from Treasury, how much would you estimate has been plundered through corruption and how much has been lost through incompetence? That's a tough call to make without all the evidence but it's possible to arrive at an educated guess. If we only look at Madupi and Kuzil, the contracting strategy that was followed was clearly wrong, exposing ESCOM to huge claims because of poor project management and extensive corruption which was well documented by the Zondo Commission. If both power stations had been built by an experienced EPC contractor, with proper financial controls and project management, they would have been finished in half the time and probably at 20 to 30 billion rand cheaper, also because of the interest that was capitalized during construction. As a result of these delays, ESCOM has spent billions burning diesel, while load shedding has cost the country billions. As I have said on a number of occasions, ESCOM loses about a billion rand a month due to crime and corruption. So the numbers are huge. And the taxpayer ultimately bears the burden also because of losses due to municipalities not paying, and Soweto, where debts have had to be repeatedly written off. Let's pause again. In the book, he explains what happened at Medupi and Kusili, and that in fact, the French firm Alstom won the tender. Now, the Eskom team, and this happened long before the arrival of Dorator, so he was using information that he gathered from the inside after his appointment, the Eskom team had worked with Alstom on a number of power stations in the past and trusted the French to build these brand new power stations which were going to bail South Africa out of its energy crisis. The ANC had done a deal with a Japanese company, Hitachi, where the ANC's investment arm called Chancellor House was the Black Economic Empowerment Partner in the group or the organization that did the bidding for the power station contracts. The ANC's Chancellor House had 25% share in that bidding company. After the first bid, Alstom won handsomely and the ANC made sure that that was not executed upon. They required another bid to be made 18 months later, which Alstom again won, despite the inside track and all the details and information being given to Hitachi. 
At this point, according to De Reiter's book, the ANT, ANC operatives then fiddled with Alstom's contract, escalated its price by 6% to ensure that Hitachi was slightly below the Alstom bid and that Hitachi could then be granted the contract to build power plants that it had no experience of and indeed were only received because of bribery. Dorator says amongst the criminality that was exposed in his book is the way that the ANC's Chancellor House engineered what he calls its 97 million rands worth of pieces of silver to switch the Madupi and Kusili contract away from Eskom's contractor of choice, Alstom, to Hitachi. He says this has cost South African taxpayers billions. I asked him to please explain how. The cost of load shedding is well known to run into the billions of rands every year because of the boiler design defects, which I would argue were baked into the contract award. Madupi and Kuzio were significantly delayed, which contributed to years more load shedding. Furthermore, to stave off the worst load shedding, ESCOM burns billions of rands of diesel every year. If we then add the opportunity cost of lost economic growth, deferred investments, jobs lost, the cost is truly ruinous. Truly ruinous. Before publication of your book, Mr. Dorator, given that you must have been aware of its consequences, did you bounce it off anyone you trust, specifically Tito Mboweni or Colin Coleman, whom you mentioned early on in the book as having lobbied for you to become Eskom CEO? If so, what has their reaction been? Have you been contacted by other members of the South African business community, if only to provide their private support? I did not bounce it off Coleman and Mboweni not least because I didn't want to compromise anyone. As I've changed my mobile number, I have not been contacted by many people, but I have been told by others of private support. South Africans face an uncertain future. Unless we tackle our problems honestly and openly, we will continue to condone by being silent, and by being silent, also being complicit. You share details of the private sector-funded investigation into Eskom criminality, including the central role of a leading philanthropist. Why does that person want to remain anonymous? And has there been any concrete consequence of his investment? I presume it's a him, could be a her, of course. Do you know if this is continuing, if the investigation is still going on? Was it really worth, in the end of the day, going, doing it, given the amount of heat that the investigation has attracted. The consequence of the investigation has been to catalyze arrests, the deployment of the army, the shutdown of 18 illegal coal sites, the deployment of specialized units of the police, changes to police structures, so I would say that the investigation has at least achieved some success. I don't want to disclose the identity of donors to the project, given that they did so anonymously. Given how I have been treated, I can understand that they don't want to disclose their identity. Quite so. Well, in an interview with Biz News six months or so ago, global energy expert K.W. Miller said that nothing he had seen anywhere in the world comes close to the Eskom disaster. I asked Andre de Reiter if he could parallel a little on this. Because the reaction from South Africa's supposed experts to that interview was not dissimilar to the way that his book has been received, i.e. conscious denial of the facts. Mr. Dorator, were you able to pay any attention to Miller's contentions? Do you think he's worth paying any attention to now? I have followed Miller's proposals. I am not sure that they have South Africa and ESCOM's best interests at heart, or whether they are aimed at securing a prime spot in a lucrative debt restructuring deal. The debt issue needs to be addressed, but I would not favor going through Miller to do it. 
I think there are better ways which will probably be cheaper and less onerous to bondholders. Miller said that Eskom bondholders, most of whom are foreign, are agitating for a massive restructuring of the state-owned enterprise into an organization which is removed from ANC control and managed by professionals. Do you think this would be an option? Or if not, what do you see as a solution? I agree that as a utility, ESCOM needs to be run by professionals who are insulated from political interference. In my view, the demise of ESCOM started when it was converted from a public utility effectively owned by its customers, to a state-owned enterprise subject to direct political supervision. Ultimately though, we need to bid farewell to the monolithic monopoly of the past, and embrace a restructured electricity industry in which the state plays a much reduced role, and where market forces drive investment and growth. There you have it again, market forces. Next question was, um, during his period in office, how did he respond to Eskom bondholders who expressed concern at the rampant criminality that is chronicled in your book, but more particularly, how did they engage after the Annika Larson interview? And you can see the picture of that on your screen. Bondholders have not engaged with me. In my experience, they are quite sanguine as long as their coupon is either explicitly or implicitly guaranteed by National Treasury. The yield reflects the perceived risk, which is part of the reason why even government guaranteed ESCOM debt trades at a premium of between 180 to 300 basis points above sovereign debt. The other reason, of course, is that the universe of investors prepared to buy debt of a heavy carbon emitter is shrinking, driving up the cost. In that interview with Annika Larson, Andre de Reta spoke about the attempted assassination on his life where he was poisoned either by cyanide, and in the book he says it could be some kind of an insecticide. He goes into a lot of detail, a lot more detail in the book, as you would imagine. So I asked him if there'd been any progress from the South African police services on that cyanide poisoning attempt, or if he had any thoughts on what might have motivated it. There are probably quite a few people sufficiently irritated with me to want me removed on a permanent basis. After a slow start, the police are now investigating, and my legal team is cooperating with that investigation. Isn't that something? Think of that again. Just let it absorb. There are probably quite a few people sufficiently irritated with me to want me removed on a permanent basis. I asked him as well if there were to be a change in government in South Africa after the 2024 national election. What advice would he give the new energy minister in their first 100 days on Eskom? And indeed, would he have any advice for the new police minister? It will be crucial to give a clear policy signal that will encourage investors, not only in new generation capacity, but also in the manufacture of renewable energy components contractors for the construction of new plants and grids and investors in debt. We also need to reassure investors that South Africa will stay the course and that they can earn a decent return to reward their capital. I'm convinced that we will then see huge investments into SA, creating jobs and ensuring that our exports don't fall foul of carbon border export taxes. From a law enforcement perspective, we need action to stop the crime wave against ESCOM. This needs to be intelligence-driven, and must look towards the root of the problem, not only the runners on the ground. It can be done, but structural problems on the ground in Mpumalonga need to be vigorously addressed if we are to make headway against the crooks. Mpumalanga, Mpumalanga, Mpumalanga. And it's been well documented that the former Deputy President of South Africa is uh, quite intimately in control of that province. My final question for Mr. Dorator, who has not named the two high-ranking politicians who he says are intimately involved in the criminality, is that he's expressed numerous forthright opinions in the book that privately many South Africans share, but are not prepared to say in the way that he has done. What gave him the motivation to do so? Are you serving a higher purpose, a higher power? Do you draw your strength from a religious or spiritual source? I think it's important to stop pretending in public that everything is okay, 
while privately complaining and making contingency plans. If we care about the country as patriots, a deeply unfashionable word, it seems, we, as citizens, need to act. If we don't, we forego the right to complain. It's a heck of a book. It's scary in many ways. What I do when I read is make marks and next to them put an NB uh, as something that I must come back to. I'll read this little part for you, which encapsulates a lot of what Andre Dorator got himself into. I thought back to a meeting I'd had soon after taking the helm in January 2020. It was with Ben Teron, a freelance forensic investigator who'd done work with the Department of Public Enterprises, the Special Investigations Unit, and ESKIM itself. I can remember that Ben's opening remark had stopped me in my tracks. Congratulations! You are now the head of the largest organized crime syndicate in South Africa, he said. Feeling somewhat insulted, I maintained a straight face, but thought to myself, surely it can't be that bad. He's probably just angling for a job by exaggerating the extent of the problem. He wasn't. I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com. 